Hi, my name is Mike Dobbs. I'm managing editor for Reminder Publications, and I'm going to be your host for this a new installment of Government Matters. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit with Springfield City Council President Orlando Ramos. Orlando, thanks for joining us Thank today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to, um, I, I want to start off with something really broad, and then we're going to sort of go down and hone it down to okay. some specific stuff. Um, what do you see as, the, as your priorities and the City Council's priorities mm -hmm. for 2017? Well, one of my top priorities, uh, as I mentioned in my acceptance speech, is um, I want to do whatever we can on the City Council side to try to help repair the relationship between the police department in the city of Springfield and the community in the city of Springfield. Um, you know, I don't think anybody can deny that uh, there could be better relationships between the two. Um, and so one of the things that I've done is I've created a police community relations committee that will be made up of residents from the city of Springfield, um, members of the police department, members of the administration. And we, the intent is to come together um, and ha hold meetings across the city and talk about how we can help strengthen the relationship between the police department and, and the community of the city of Springfield. Now, I understand, I know you talked about that in your, your speech, as you just mentioned. Uh, if I remember correctly, you had sort of a time limit, a deadline that you wanted to get this thing formed and up and running. Mm -hmm. How close are we to actually having this, uh, this committee ready to, to start talking to the public and talking to the police? Very close, actually. I, I, I received several recommendations from the ward counselors, which each of them had uh, one appointment to the committee. Um, and I've also received a uh, response from the police union and some of the other folks that had appointments to the committee. Uh, and so we're very close to finalizing the, the names of this committee. Um, and I'm hopeful that by next week, late next week, I'll be able to make an announcement as to who is going to sit on the committee and when they'll begin holding meetings. And in terms of the way this committee would work, what's your vision? Is it, uh, is, are you going to have uh, open meetings in various neighborhoods across the city? Mm -hmm. Are you hoping to get very specific about people's concerns about how they see the police and maybe police concerns about how they interact with the public? Sure, that's the goal. The goal is to hold meetings um, in every neighborhood in the city of Springfield. And to give everyone an opportunity to weigh in. You know, we want to hear both from the, from the public, but we also want to hear from the police department. And we want to hear their concerns as to how the community can help them better serve the community and protect, you know, the, those who they're, who they're sworn to serve and protect. And so we want to bring everyone into the same room and have a, a respectful and meaningful conversation around how we can work together to help protect the citizens of the city of Springfield and to help to protect our, our police officers as well. Do you see this as something simply lasting this year, or do you see this as maybe something um, that would extend into next year, into 2018? Well, um, as a special committee for the City Council, um, we, we create these committees with a, with a timeline. And so the, my hope is that by the end of this year, they'll have recommendations ready. And those recommendations will be, will be made to the mayor, and they will be made to the Springfield City Council. Um, and hopefully, you know, we're hoping to get some meaningful um, policy and, and recommendations as to what sort of policy we can create. And uh, once they accomplish that goal, um, then the intent is to dissolve the committee and implement the, the recommendations that they recommend. Now, I know that people who follow the city council know that uh, there was a, a vote uh, prior to you becoming president concerning a police commission <laughs> versus um, the current um, the current setup that we've got in the city where the police commissioner has a great deal of power and responsibility. Um, the civilian side is, has been diminished, let's yeah. say, over the years. Do you see the recommendations that may come out of your special committee perhaps playing into the formation of a police commission and how that new police commission would look and would act since there was criticism about previous police commissions being overtly political. Um, and I'm sure that that's something that anyone on the council who wanted this new commission would like to avoid. Sure. Um, so do you think that the two may be somehow related in, in the future? They may be. Um, the, only, the only thing is that the commission has already been um, 
voted on. You know, the city council has already voted to reestablish the police commission. And so I don't see that being something that will be um, uh, addressed again in, in any way. It's already been established, it's already been voted on. Um, but we, we, it doesn't mean that that's not something that's off the table. You know, we can continue to have discussions around the police commission and their role um, and how, how they can help um, protect the city of Springfield and protect the citizens and protect, protect the police department. And so that might, I'm sure that that'll come up in discussion. You know, it's up to um, the people and, and up to the, the members of the committee as to what they want to discuss. Um, I'm sure that'll be a topic of, of conversation, but I don't see the um, establishment of the police commission changing in any way, you know, seeing as it's, it's already been decided. Okay. Now, I know that another one of your priorities that you spoke about is this other committee that you formed, which is a casino oversight committee. Yes. So I want to talk about that for a couple minutes. Okay. Um, I mean, we're sitting <clears throat> in an MGM property yeah. right now. I mean, it's happening right over there. Uh, and it's, it's, to me, it's amazing just the speed at mm -hmm. which things are happening. Mm -hmm. um, but that speed shouldn't... Um, blind us to what is happening and what isn't happening. I mean, I'll express a concern of mine since I've got your ear, and that mm -hmm. is I want to know what's happening with the 54 apartments that they're supposed to be building. Yes. The last time I did a story about this, MGM basically gave me a uh, very noncommittal answer about a timeline, and yet they do own the former school department building here at, <clears throat> on State Street, which is going to be the location for about 30 of those apartments. Uh, they haven't yet announced where the other 24 or so would be. Um, so as a citizen and as someone who is going to be living about a little over a mile away from the casino, uh, I'm concerned about that aspect. What are they doing to, to do mm. that? So is this committee designed to maybe get some answers to those types of questions, like what is the status of various aspects of the host community agreement? This committee is designed to do exactly that. You know, we... We want to be proactive. We have the, the biggest economic development project in, in, in the history of Western Massachusetts right here in the city of Springfield. And so we want to be proactive. We want to make sure that we get it right. You know, we don't want to come back afterwards and say, oh, we forgot to address this or they should have done this differently. We want to be proactive in this process. And so I, I thought that it was, um, I thought that it was a good idea to, to form this committee made up of city councilors um, to address those issues before they come up. And one of the first things that I anticipate will come out of that committee is exactly that. Let's have a meeting around, you know, where, where are those apartments going to go? Because just as you haven't had any information, we haven't had any information, um, any new information from them. And so rather than sit back and wait, we have to, we have to um, bring them in and ask those questions ahead of time. So the, the um, casino... Oversight Committee is chaired by Council Fenton and is made up of the chairman of Echo, Echo Dev, who is uh, Council Gomez, the chairman of Finance, who is Tim Allen, the chairman of Public Safety, Tom Ash, and the chairman of Audit, which is uh, Council Fenton. And I'm going to be announcing next week who the fifth member of that commission, committee will be. Will that be another city councilor? It will be. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what concerns do you have about? the casino, or do you have concerns at this point that have helped motivated the creation of this committee? Absolutely. My, you know, my biggest concern is, are they meeting the numbers? They promised us in the host community agreement that they were going to hire um, a certain percentage of Springfield residents, a certain percentage of women. In, in the construction aspect. In the construction yep. aspect of it. And um, a certain percentage of minorities. And so are they meeting those numbers? Are they exceeding those numbers? Are they doing everything that they can to meet those numbers? You know, and I, wanna, I, I would like to know what efforts they're, they're, they're making to um, provide job opportunities to Springfield residents once the casino does open. And so that's one thing. Another thing that, that can come out of this committee is, um, you know, let's have a conversation around what, you, what they're doing what the numbers look like, and is there anything else that needs to be changed in order to help them meet those numbers? Um, I was wondering if part of that committee's responsibility would also be talking to MGM about um, just what they anticipate the impact is going to be traffic-wise and how it will relate to businesses in the South End. Mm. We've already lost one business that was in the South End for many years, City Vacuum, which is in the same building as Milano's. 
Um, in fact, I had a conversation with the guy. He moved to Chicopee, and he says he's not doing as well in this new location. Mm -hmm. However, he was very concerned about what ultimately his business would look like once the once the casino was up and running. So I, I'm wondering if part of this is also going to be trying to anticipate some of these issues that are going to affect businesses or, that are already in the South End. Part of the the um, the responsibility of, the, of, of this committee will be to reach out to those business owners and ask you know, what concerns they have. And so I, I would anticipate having a meeting in the future where that will be um, around the, the topic of you know, how we can help these businesses, surrounding businesses around MGM a little bit better. Um, let me ask you something that every city council president has to be asked, okay. which is, now, now I've got you scared. Um, <laughs> And, and that is relationships with the mayor, yes. because um, in the years that I've been covering Springfield politics, mm. there have been very few city councils that haven't somehow um, had some tension or conflict with the mayor over particular policies. And I'm just not talking about uh, Mayor Sarno, but mm. mayors in general. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's sort of a built-in check and balance you guys are the legislative branch of the government, mm -hmm. um, so therefore you ask a lot of questions and you're concerned about a lot of the things that the executive branch is proposing mm -hmm. or doing. So let me ask you about, about the relationship that you feel this council uh, has with the mayor and uh, the, uh, the relationship that you think might develop um, with the mayor. Well, one of the first things that I did when I knew that I had the votes uh, with the city council to be president is I reached out to the mayor. You know, I, I sat down with him, uh, we had a conversation, and I, I told him uh, that my intent is to work together. You know, we have the same goal in mind. Um, we want to do what's best for the city of Springfield. And so I don't see any reason why the legislative branch and the executive branch could not work together to reach that common goal. Um, is it, this is a fresh start. You know, I, I, I've seen and I've read about everything that you just mentioned in the past, but uh, as I told the mayor, this is a fresh start um, between the city council and, and his administration, and I look forward to working with them to, together with him on, in making progress in our city. Um, I'm sure that there'll be disagreements. There have already been disagreements um, as a councilman, and I've, I haven't always agreed with everything that the mayor has, has said or proposed. Um, and I'm sure that he feels the same way um, about some of the things that I've proposed on a city council. However, we, one of the things that I appreciate about, um, about Mayor Sarno is the fact that we can, we, that we can respectfully disagree. Uh, the governor has just come out with his, with his budget. Um, we've got uh, a president in Washington, which is a, with a big question mark about his budget priorities and how they're going to affect the states mm -hmm. and therefore how it's going to affect cities and towns. So right now, the city of Springfield has got basically a double-edged sword when it comes to budget, the state side, sure. uh, which is a little bit more predictable, uh, and the federal side. Uh, Springfield is a city that is very much dependent upon outside revenue source uh, from the state. Um, do you see this being a challenge for the council when it comes to evaluating the budget that the mayor is going to be putting together, um, looking at what the realities are that are influencing the amount of money that we've that we will have to run the city effect effectively? I mean, it's always it's always a challenge. We never know exactly how much is going to come from the state. We never know exactly how much is going to come from the federal level. And so it's, it's always a challenge, you know, but the, these conversations are um, conversations that take place during the budget session. Um, you know, Councilor Frenton in the past has done a very good job of holding meetings, a series of meetings leading up to the, the actual vote to approve the budget. Um, and I intend to continue that. You know, I'm hope, hopeful that we'll have a series of meetings leading up to the actual vote. Um, prior to taking that vote for the FY18 budget. I know in the past that uh, the mayor has opened up a lot of the budget meetings that he has with the department heads mm -hmm. to members of the city council. Is that something that you hope 
I, I don't know if you've attended them in the past, but I'm, I'm going to ask you, is this something that you would attend if you had the time and the ability to just hear directly from the department heads what their needs are? Absolutely. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that's a conversation that I'm willing to have with the mayor. I'm, I'm, I, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to make as many meetings as possible because it is important for us to be more involved in that in this budget process. You know, some of the some of the concerns that I've heard from some of my colleagues is the fact that we in, in the past we have not been as involved as we should have. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the mayor's administration will give us a little bit more of a role in uh, forming this budget because ultimately it comes down to the city council vote. If we don't approve it, it doesn't go through. And so um, it would be beneficial to everyone involved for the city council to have the information as quickly as possible and in a timely manner so that we're not, so that we have time to evaluate it and to discuss um, our concerns. Because that's always an issue about when you get, when you actually get a budget and mm -hmm. then how much time do you have in order to sure. vet the budget before you have to vote on it. Um, to, to make sure it, it, it's implemented properly for the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And I know in the past sometimes that, that can get a little bit, a little bit dodgy yeah. in terms of the amount of time that the, the council has got for these things. Um, do you have a budget priority? Do you, you know, some people say we have to give more money to the police or we have to give more money to, you know, public safety such as the fire department. Mm -hmm. Do you as a city councilor see a budget priority that, that you really believe we should maybe focus on a little bit more? I think every legislator has several budget priorities. Um, I'll tell you a couple of mine. Uh, one of the things that I've been advocating for over the last several years is more funding to go towards after school programs. We have a tendency to rely more on private funding for these after school programs. Um, but some of my colleagues and, and including myself um, think that the city should be putting, prioritizing these after school programs. And so we have to show that we have a commitment to these after school programs. And if we end up getting private funds to extend the program and to expand, then, then that'll be great. But we have to take the initiative to put these, uh, to make sure that these programs are gonna be in place regardless. Um, the second priority of, of, of mine is, is the court enforcement um, department. I have proposed a rental property ordinance in the past. And I've held several meetings on this ordinance. And one of the things that keeps coming up is the fact that the court enforcement department is undermanned and underfunded. And so I made that a top priority of mine to make sure that in this next budget cycle, the department has as many staff as they need and that they have the funds made available to them so that they can do the job effectively. They're not able to do even though they do a good job with some of the bigger issues across the city, because of the, 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 the limits that they have, they, they're not able to do some of the smaller things. You know, these, and these are quality of life issues. You know, if, you, if, if uh, there's a property in your neighborhood that has a, you know, a pile of trash in the backyard or whatever it is, that's a quality of life issue. It's not, it's not an emergency, right. but it affects your neighborhood. You know, and, and these are the things that we have to be able to address in a, in a, in a better, um, timely manner and in order to do that, we have to make sure that our court enforcement department is fully funded, fully staffed, and then to make sure that they have the, the resources that they need to do their job. So that's just a couple of, of my, um, uh, my top priorities. And so hopefully you can translate some of this into a budget with discussions with the mayor and with, with department heads. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Um, one thing that we do on this program is that we want to find out how you got into this? What what was the what was the process like for Orlando Ramos to want to run for the city council to begin with, and much less then seek the presidency? So, when did your interest in public service first come about? Yeah, my my everybody's story is different. Mine is uh, really unique. I, I I never thought that I was going to get into public office. I never thought that I would run for public office. You know, I I don't come up from a family that is politically involved. Um, and I wasn't really fully informed with, you know, local government and the way that government works. I come from the construction industry. I was a carpenter. Straight from high school, after I graduated from Putnam Vocational High School, 
I went into the construction industry. I was a nine unit laborer for a couple of years. Then I joined the Carpenters Union Local 108. It was there that, um, you know, I made a great living being a carpenter. I worked my way up from being a, an apprentice. Um, I reached journeyman status. Um, I got appointed as a steward. I was one of the youngest stewards in the 100 year history of, of my local. Um, I think I was 25 the first time that I, that I became a steward. And then I got elected to the executive board of, of my union. And it was on a job, um, actually in Holyoke, when I was working as a steward at Mary's Meadow, where I approached uh, my business agent and I told him, and I, I had a very frank conversation with him and I said, you know, I've noticed that there aren't a lot of people of color in, on these jobs. Um, and I'm wondering what I can do as a union member and as a steward and as an executive board member to help increase the membership within our local unions. And he had a very frank conversation with me. He said, look, it isn't really the, the, it isn't really the union's fault. It is up to the contractors to hire um, the workers. And so he was very honest with me and said, look, the reason why there aren't a lot of you is because they don't have to hire you. You know, he was very honest. And he said, there, there aren't any laws that say that they have to hire you. And I said, I wanted to change that. So what I did is I made it my priority to do some research and to come up with a way that we can legislate making um, contractors or, or, to, or to help contractors um, hire more minorities to the construction industry. And what I found it was that there was this, this law, this ordinance called the Responsible Employee Ordinance. And it was in the books in 18 different municipalities across the state of Massachusetts. Springfield was actually one of them, hmm. but it wasn't being enforced. And so um, with the help of other uh, unions, with the help of my business agent, and with the help of some of the local uh, legislators here, I got involved in helping rewrite the law. And we rewrote the Responsible Employer Ordinance in the city of Springfield. Uh, we brought it forward to the Springfield City Council at the time, and it passed unanimously. And in the process, I made a lot of friends. Um, I ended up getting her on the job, and it was the third time that I had suffered an on-the-job on um, injury. And I remember I was sitting at home one day, and I was thinking to myself, I was 27, I was 27 years old, and I, I, I didn't really have a plan B. You know, if I couldn't go back to doing construction, what was I going to do with the rest of my life? Sure, yeah. And that was when I decided that I wanted to go back to school and pursue a college degree. And while I was at school, I got offered an internship at the Western Mass Governor's Office with uh, Deval Patrick's office here mm -hmm. in Springfield. Um, and from there, I just you know, it took off. I fell in love with public service. Um, I found that to be my, my real passion uh, to serve others. And when I heard that the city of Springfield was going back to the ward representation um, system, I decided to throw my hat in the ring. And that's how it all got started. So in your particular case, you were just a guy who saw an opportunity to take action on a very serious issue. Yes. Um, which is, I think, a path that a lot of people get into politics that mm -hmm. way. They, they find an issue that means something sure. very personal to them, but yet has ramifications for the larger community. And when we're talking about what you were involved in, we're talking about job development, we're talking about uh, breaking cycles of poverty, we're talking about improvements of neighborhood, all the things that go along with people getting um, a job that can get you into the middle class, a job that can propel you toward <clears throat> home ownership. Um, did you like the whole campaigning thing, though? I mean, you know, uh, serving is one thing. Getting yeah. there is getting there can be rough. Yes, it, it wasn't easy for me. I, I, I didn't win my first campaign. I came up just 80 votes short. Ran again two years later. I came up 40 votes short. And You're it making was, progress. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't until the third time that I finally, um, I finally was victorious and, and got on the council. It's fun being out there, meeting new people, and talking and campaigning. Um, 
But the politics of it all, I, I can live without. You know, I, there, there's, two, there's two parts of, of what we do, right? There's the politics and then there's governing. And I prefer governing, I enjoy governing. Politics, not so much. But as Bill Clinton famously said, you can't have one without the other. Um, if you really want to, if you want to govern, you have to uh, learn how to be, um, how to how to do well in the, on the political side. And so it's part of the, it's part of the job. You know, I, I I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy meeting people. Um, but some of the politics can get a little bit uh, a little bit un undesirable. One thing about the city council. It would appear to me it's one of the most representative city councils of, of this of the city of mm -hmm. ours, um, and we've made great strides from it being uh, a city council that traditionally, for many years, was all white men, with the exception of one African American person, because mm -hmm. for a long time that's how it it worked out, and now we have a council that actually looks like the city. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that as an advantage in terms of trying to get? other people into politics? You know, if, if you're talking to younger people and you say that public service is really good and it's positive and it can, it can do good things, uh, is it easier to point to a city council that actually looks like the city of Springfield? Absolutely. It's, it's great to be a part of the city's first um, ever minority majority council. And it's a council that, as you said, reflects the population of the city of Springfield. And so it's great to, to be able to point to this and tell people that if they want to, if they want to get into um, politics and they want to get into government, and they're interested in never running for office, that they can do it and they can actually be successful. You couldn't do that ten years ago because you couldn't point to anybody and say, you know, you 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 can be him or you can be her, you know. But now that we have a minority majority council, it's it's become the norm, you know. And 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 it's uh, it's great that we can actually tell people. Um, and feel that everyone is on a, on, on a level playing field. This ward representation system has really done wonders for the city of Springfield, and it's the reason why we have a minority majority council right now. Well, at least now with ward representation, if someone chooses to run, it's, it's a more realistic goal because a ward is a defined, a defined number of people, defined uh, geographic area. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the old system, which is you're running at large, across the entire city, yeah. which is very daunting, both um, in terms just of physical, being everywhere you need to be if you're an at-large mm -hmm. candidate, much less the money that's involved. It's a far more expensive thing. With the ward representation, um, I, I think it actually democratizes the entire process that people don't feel like, I have to raise $100,000 mm -hmm. in order to run for office. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, and that's one of the biggest differences is it's not easy to raise money for campaigns. You know, I really don't enjoy asking people for money. Uh, that's one of the, my least favorite things to do as uh, a candidate, as an elected official. Um, so it, it does make, make it a lot easier for uh, people who want to run at ward to reach, you know, and to, and to be victorious at the, um, and win a seat on the city council. Okay, I just want to give people the chance if they want to contact you as the city council president, as a member of the city council, what's the best way of getting a hold of you? Email goes straight to my phone. Um, email makes it a lot easier for, for people to get in contact with me because I can't always get to answer phone calls. Uh, my email address, my personal email address is oramos108 at AOL.com. It's on the city website. They can go to the city website and email me from there. Orlando Ramos, thank you so much for taking the time today Thank you. Thanks for to be me. with us. And thanks, folks, for watching Government Matters.